My sister sabotaged my wedding. And now, with her struggles to conceive, my parents want her to share my baby. As a little background, my sister Pam, 30F, persuaded our parents and a few of our family members not to come to my wedding. She believed it was inappropriate for me to marry her while she was divorcing. She turned to lying and spreading rumors to get people to avoid me because the truth alone wasn't enough to make them hate me. My spouse and I recently shared on social media that I am currently in my second trimester of pregnancy, I am 27F. My parents and Pam learned about it in this way, and after we had not spoken for over three years, they tried to mend things with me. Why? Pam is sadly unable to conceive due to her infertility. Despite the fact that she has failed multiple IVF cycles, she is adamant about trying again. Pam does not believe that surrogacy or adoption are the best options for her at this time. Since I'm expecting a child, my parents thought it would be beneficial to make amends with Pam so she could spend time with a child who is not directly linked to her. They even proposed that the child have two mothers, saying that this would benefit me because I would receive more assistance. My parents really only want to pretend to be a happy family, now that Pam is unable to have children of her own. During the call, I was able to see through their phony politeness. I informed them that I would not accept this idea and that it was completely irrational to expect me to comply. To be honest, it was ridiculous that they even believed I would think about letting Pam act as the mother of my future child. I clarified that they shouldn't have done it because I was expecting a baby and they wanted to give Pam a plaything, but rather because they truly loved me and were sorry for how they treated me. They took issue at what I said claiming that Pam was prepared to volunteer for her future niece or nephew and that they were just providing assistance because they knew I would require assistance when the kid was born. They said I was being too harsh and that it was all perfectly innocent. I replied that my husband and in-laws were already providing me with all the assistance I required because I was the mother. They should keep avoiding me in the future if it was easy for them to do so in the past. Here's where I might have gone too far. I suggested that Pam might not be able to conceive because she was a horrible person and wouldn't be a good mother. My parents, a few family members, and of course Pam herself sent me a ton of texts after that call. They all demand that I should apologize to them, claiming that what I said was needless and unkind. I shouldn't kick people when they're already down, they say. The issue is that I can still clearly recall every event leading up to my wedding, and I harbor deep animosity toward Pam for her actions. I find it hard to feel bad about what I said. To put things in perspective, while I was organizing my wedding, Pam had already been married for two years. Prior to their marriage, she and her ex-husband had been dating for three years, and she had always understood his desire to live a childless life. When they began talking about their future after a year of dating, it was among the first things she brought up to our parents. Even though I was in the room at the time, they continued their chat as usual, acting as though I wasn't there. Another problem is that, even as a child, Pam and I have never gotten along. She has always been the beloved daughter of our parents. When we were younger, we used to quarrel a lot but eventually we just learned to ignore one another. She therefore knew for a fact that she wanted children in the future, even if she was telling our parents that her ex-boyfriend preferred a childless existence. In the end, they agreed to bring up the subject again when they were married, and she hoped that by then, he would have changed his mind. She tried to persuade him to have children, but he refused to change his views, and they started fighting a lot. She would frequently look very distraught at family gatherings and tell about how hard it was to stay with him all the time. Her decision to wed a man who had made it apparent that he didn't want children was, in my opinion, her fault. It was she who thought she could make him reconsider. However, she had no right to hold him responsible when she was unable to. Naturally, I kept all of this to myself since I knew it would just cause more problems. I tried to persuade him for a few months before my parents informed me that Pam had returned to live with them permanently following a heated argument with her husband. They told me there was no way out of it at this point. My spouse and I had just begun making deposits for our wedding at this point. After almost four years of dating, we had been engaged for a few months. We had waited until we were both comfortable in our employment, even though we had been prepared for marriage for a while. My parents therefore told me that they wanted me to put off my wedding forever when they told me that Pam and her husband were going to divorce. They didn't want me to marry Pam at the same time she was divorcing in order to offend her. They said that Pam already had it difficult because she had to postpone her intentions to have a baby. They said that I should not forward with my wedding in order to spare her feelings because she truly wanted to become a mother. It was likely the most ridiculous and inconsiderate thing they had ever tried to get me to do. I informed them, of course, that I would not delay my wedding for Pam. Whether she liked it or not, I was going to marry. Since we were never close, I didn't care what she thought about my wedding. But my choice did not sit well with my parents. 
They were upset because I wasn't prepared to put their beloved daughter's sentiments ahead of my own wedding arrangements. They warned me that they wouldn't go if I didn't postpone the wedding. I knew my parents had a soft place for Pam, but I never imagined they would go to such lengths for her, so that was incredibly upsetting and devastating to me. Nevertheless, I accepted it and informed them that they may do as they pleased. Pam wasn't content, even though it should have been the end of it. She didn't like that I was getting married, so she made sure the rest of the family didn't come either. She initially only tried to win people over by saying that it was rude of me to get married while she was going through such a difficult period. Although the majority expressed sympathy for her, they did not specifically state that they would not attend my wedding. She made the decision to step it up after realizing this. She began spreading stories about me because the truth wasn't contentious enough. Pam started claiming that I had been persuading her husband to divorce her because I was envious of her and couldn't bear the idea of her having a child before me. I had never been friends with her spouse, so the allegations were ridiculous. If he and I had ever gotten close, I genuinely doubt Pam would have married him at all. People began to believe her, though, for some reason. She even claimed that I had been bothering her by convincing her spouse that he would be happier without her and manipulating him to leave her. Pam claims that I was to blame for his lack of desire for children since I had reportedly persuaded him that having no children was the way to go for our generation. All of it was false. I assume she lied so firmly that others started to believe her, even though I hadn't really engaged with my brother-in-law when he was married to Pam. Many folks turned down my wedding invites. A couple of my supportive cousins and other family members told me about Pam's comments, so I already knew why. I wasn't shocked to learn that no one provided me with a detailed explanation for their refusal. Only a few relatives and a few individuals from my side of the family came to my wedding. Everyone else was either a friend or a co-worker. On the bride's side, the attendance was dreadfully poor. In the weeks before the wedding, I recall being really furious about all of this. Many individuals had already made up their minds, and some had even blocked me, but I knew I could try talking to them and being honest. I didn't bother because it would have been my word against hers. Fortunately, my spouse, friends, and in-laws were there to support me on the wedding day. I barely noticed that so many of my family members weren't present because they made sure I had so much fun. I haven't forgiven Pam for what she did though, simply because I had a good time on my wedding day. She was vengeful and vicious in what she did. She made sure I wasn't happy just because she didn't get her way, which was quite typical of her. She had been like way since she was a child, but most people get over those habits, especially by the time they are in their late 20s. Regretfully, I am unable to say the same for her. I cut her and my parents off entirely after that incident, and my animosity toward them only deepened. I saw Pam's ex-husband for the first time since their divorce around a year later. One day while my husband and I were out to lunch, we noticed him eating with some of his co-workers. We weren't expecting him to greet us, so it was a little awkward, but he approached our table, congratulated us on our wedding, and expressed regret for not being there. He clarified that it was because of my sister's predicament. We were also courteous because he was chit-chatting and my husband even made a joke about how he might as well have come because Pam didn't show up. Pam's ex-husband then appeared truly perplexed. At that point, we began discussing the events leading up to the wedding. He revealed how Pam had repeatedly postponed the mediation sessions and postponed the divorce by claiming she was too preoccupied with getting ready for my wedding. When her ex-husband learned she hadn't even gone, he became perplexed. Her sudden interest in my wedding had surprised him, but he had refrained from confronting her because he didn't want to accuse her of postponing the divorce out of fear. He just dealt with everything as calmly as he could. We discussed the facts after he gave us his version of events, which included Pam's failure to attend the wedding, her spreading false information about me, and her accusation that I was attempting to end her marriage. After expressing his shock that Pam would act in such a manner, he revealed the true cause of their split. It was a far deeper issue than a dispute over having kids. After months of arguments about whether or not to have children, her ex-husband finally began to take her point of view into consideration and was on the verge of changing his mind. She told him something that made all the difference the day he made the decision to talk to her about it. She appeared ecstatic when he informed her that he was at last prepared to think about being a parent. Then in what she believed to be a jest, she said that he would have had to accept it sooner rather than later, even if he hadn't been prepared. She acknowledged that she had surreptitiously stopped taking her birth control pills without notifying him when he asked her to explain. She might have gotten pregnant if they had kept going that way, making plans for him to simply deal with it. He was unable to accept this perverse scheme. She had deceived us into believing that their disagreements were solely about having children, but in reality, their most recent dispute had been about her treachery. Pam made an effort to make it seem lighthearted, but it didn't make her actions any less serious. 
In essence, she was attempting to trick him into becoming pregnant so that he would be forced to accept the pregnancy at any time. My husband and I were more clearer on why she had behaved so erratically around the time of our wedding after that talk with her ex-husband. She was aware that she was to blame for her divorce. She could have kept it to herself and none of this would have occurred, even if she had taken the risky decision to stop taking her birth control. She may have even given birth to a child with her spouse, but she ruined everything for herself before venting her frustration on me. I became much more resentful of her after discovering all of this. I had the option of telling my parents and other family members the truth, but I decided against it. I had already severed my connections with people who hadn't been at my wedding by that point, and to be honest, I just wanted to get on with my life. I made the decision to remain silent and continue. But to be honest, I don't feel bad about what I said because I hate her so much. I genuinely think it's fortunate that she hasn't been able to have children because I don't think someone with her personality could be a decent mother. The fact that she and my parents only contacted me because I am pregnant and they wish to play happy family with my unborn child further bothers me. That simply will not occur. Regarding the notion of my child having two mothers, I concur with my in-laws and my spouse that it is not essential. People's reactions to my comment, especially those with whom I get along, are the only reason I'm even slightly unsure. So am I the jerk for suggesting that my sister might not make a good mother, which is why she hasn't been able to conceive? In response to inquiries, Pam has not remarried and, to the best of my knowledge, is not currently seeing anyone. Although I don't know much about her personal life, I've learned from friends and family that she is totally unmarried and that her primary goal at the moment is to have children. You can guess why she isn't interested in adopting a child or using a surrogate. In my opinion, it's because she feels that a child isn't truly your child unless you've given birth to it yourself. She has been trying for over three years, including when she tried to conceive with her spouse and when she used donors for IVF following the divorce. So far, nothing has worked for her. Most people would think about other choices by now, but she isn't interested, and that's her decision. The fact that she and my parents only tried to reconcile, after I revealed my pregnancy is what truly seems odd. The remark about two mothers stuck with me. Additionally, you all observed that they made particular reference to the fact that this baby would be linked to her by blood. Technically speaking, my child would be her blood relative because she is my biological sister. However, bringing it up while trying to make amends is odd, and their actions simply gave off a disturbing, almost baby-stealer atmosphere. I'm afraid she'll start projecting and acting like the mother if I do try to forgive her and give her some contact with my child. I can't allow that to occur. Some of you have questioned why I haven't defended myself in front of the rest of the family or, spoken out about the true cause of her divorce. In all honesty, I don't believe it's worth it. I became aware of my true friends and supporters after the wedding. Everything that transpired deeply wounded me, and even though I wanted to speak out about the truth, I decided against it. I wanted to be left alone. Even a few family members with whom I get along well said that I was a little callous when I told Pam that she couldn't have children. Although they don't expect me to apologize, they do believe it was a little too severe. These folks have always stood behind me, so that's why I'm worried. If they too think I was too severe, then maybe I should be worried. Update 1. I appreciate all of the comments left on my post. I appreciate your support, even though it seems like most of you believe I'm NTA. I will continue to ignore Pam and my parents, and I have made the decision not to apologize to them. They are obviously unhappy about this. On social media and in real life, they are acting like the victim and disparaging me in front of our family members once more. I already don't talk to those people, so I'm not bothered by it. What could possibly go wrong, that they will further isolate me? I made the decision to talk to my family members that support me yet disagree with my remark and address it. Almost everyone in the family is aware of what happened and what I said and Pam and my parents have made a big issue out of it. I reached out to people who truly care about me since I won't engage with someone I don't get along with. I admitted to them that, in the heat of the moment, I had uttered those things. However, that doesn't change the fact that Pam's deliberate attempt to draw attention to herself during my wedding was much worse. For years, Pam has been mean and disrespectful to me, and I won't say I'm sorry for something that might even be true. She won't be significantly impacted by my remark, at least not in the same manner that she did me when she created rumors. Because of what she said, my family declined to come to my wedding. It's not the same thing because my viewpoint won't stop her from being pregnant. Those who were on my side are still supportive, and my relatives seem to understand this. I'm okay with them deciding not to talk about it anymore. All I want is for my pregnancy to be a joyful and healthy one. I hope this tension between Pam and my parents ends quickly. I don't want them to stretch this out because I might have to tell them some things they won't like. This is something I really don't want to deal with, 
especially now that I'm expecting. Update 2. My parents have been playing the victim and informing everyone in the family about what I said for the past two weeks since I last spoke to them on the phone. They have been pleading with others to avoid me, to never communicate with me again, and even to cut me off from family members that get along well with me. They basically want me shunned by the entire family. My parents haven't been successful in their strategy though, because as I indicated, I was able to work things out with the people I care about. They obviously didn't like it, so they posted disparaging remarks about me on social media. I am aware that the posts are about me even if they haven't specifically mentioned me. They have been discussing a particular relative who has always tried to ruin lives, and always been jealous of Pam. That's why I allegedly made fun of her infertility, they say. I knew it was all lies, so at first I didn't care. But it really got to me when they recently posted that I was the one who destroyed Pam's marriage. I chose to reply since they were repeating the same falsehoods they had told me around the time of my wedding. I made contact with my former brother-in-law. Even if we don't communicate frequently, we are on speaking terms because we still greet one other on holidays and on our birthdays. I told him everything that had been going on and asked if he would mind if I told the truth in public. I did what he told me to do. The drama has escalated since I wrote about Pam's actions and the true cause of their divorce. Although I haven't spoken to anyone directly, family members have been calling, texting and emailing me to ask whether it's true, to ask me to remove the post, and even to accuse me of lying about Pam once more. None of them have received a response from me. My parents and Pam on the other hand, have remained remarkably silent, which suggests that they have little to defend themselves. They'll find words though, I'm sure. Even after all of this, it's disheartening that no one in the family has bothered to apologize to me, but it's okay since it's exactly what I anticipated. I believe I've been successful in exposing Pam for who she truly is, which was my major objective. I'm just going to relax and observe what happens next. Update 3. Pam and my parents finally contacted me a few days after my last post, stating that they were prepared to apologize. But only if I consented to have my post removed. The rest of the family hasn't expressed regret to me, but they seem to have contacted my parents and Pam to criticize their actions. They told my parents that it was unfair to portray me negatively when Pam was ultimately to blame for her divorce. My relationships with my parents have suffered greatly as a result of their years of deceiving the family. It's amazing how fast certain family members went from detesting me to betraying Pam. However, as I already stated, I don't hold it in high regard for those who assumed that I was the cause of Pam's marital issues. They're now equally eager to assume that she was at fault from the beginning. They still refuse to say sorry, and the majority of them have ceased getting in touch with me. No one is requesting me to remove the post, and no one is interested in knowing if I was speaking the truth. I replied to Pam and my parents that I would wait to remove the post until I felt like it. I don't care about their apologies anymore. I responded to their email correspondence and subsequently blocked them. They haven't made an attempt to get in touch with me since, but this morning I made the decision to remove the post, not for them, but rather because I don't want my social media accounts to be overflowing with posts about unimportant people. Retaliation isn't beneficial, and as I mentioned, I want a pleasant and healthy pregnancy journey. Furthermore, I believe that's sufficient punishment for Pam and my parents because they are who they are. I have family and friends who truly care about me, and my spouse and I are content. I really only need that. It doesn't really matter what my sister and parents are doing these days. I hope they understand after everything that has transpired that I don't want to interact with them ever again and avoid me. That's all I have to say, and considering everything that has happened, I doubt they will get in touch anytime soon. I'm grateful to everyone who has helped me, answered my messages and given me guidance. It is really important to me. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real life stories happening around you. Parents accused me of an affair with my brother in law, threw me out, and tried to destroy my career. The shocking truth uncovered. Over the past six years, I have established a prosperous career as a senior programmer at a large software business. My parents insist on family values and sticking together, so even though I make more than enough money to live on my own in a wonderful apartment, I've been living with them. Although they have always been domineering, I persuaded myself that it was simply their expression of affection. The environment in our home has always been complicated. This is also where my sister Emily, 32F, and her husband James, 34M reside. Three years ago, James obtained a job close by, and our parents were overjoyed, so they moved back. With her ideal life, marriage, and grades, Emily has always been the golden child. The comparison began in our early years and has continued ever since. I love my sister, don't get me wrong, 
but sharing a home has been difficult. Since I work from home the majority of the time, my folks are always watching me. They keep an eye on who I speak to on video conversations, when I start work, and when I take breaks. They have persuaded themselves that this degree of engagement in my life is both required and typical. Even though my precise schedule is shown on the refrigerator, my mother frequently interrupts me in my home office during crucial meetings, saying she forgot I was working. Michael, my 29-year-old lover, lives across the nation. He has been tremendously supportive over our three years of long-distance dating. But he and our relationship were never accepted by my parents. They treat James as the son they never had and compare him to him all the time. They attack every aspect of Michael, including his choice to live on the West Coast, his work as a software engineer, ironically, the same field as myself, and even his attire when we video chat. James has always been cordial, not only as his wife's sibling but also as a little sister. We had a good relationship and I valued having someone who didn't criticize me all the time. He frequently defended me during family dinners when my parents began their routine comments about my life choices, as if he understood the burden I was under. Up until two weeks ago everything was in control. With solemn faces, my parents summoned me into the living room. I was managing a group of developers on a significant software update during a pivotal project phase, so the timing couldn't have been worse. On my laptop, they said, they discovered offensive text that purportedly demonstrated my attempt to conduct an affair with James. I was caught completely off guard. The messages they displayed to me were obviously fake and completely out of context. Some appeared to be completely made up, while others were excerpts from business exchanges that had been altered to appear suggestive. I attempted to explain that I'm really in love with Michael and that James is like a brother to me, so I would never do anything like that. They wouldn't look, even when I promised to show them my actual message history. They refused to pay attention. I've always envied Emily's happiness, my mother said, sobbing. And she should have anticipated this because of my rebellious nature. I was a disgrace to the family, according to my enraged father. In the midst of the largest project of my career, they gave me a 24-hour notice to leave the house, a 24-hour notice to pack up my entire existence. I called my grandparents in tears and desperation. They have always been my refuge and our family's sane voice. They immediately believed me after I showed them the actual mails and gave them all the details. They took me in, provided me with housing, and helped me get through this ordeal. In order for me to continue working, my grandfather even assisted me in setting up a makeshift home office in their spare room. My father was furious to learn that I was staying with them. When I wasn't there, he actually came to their house and yelled at them for enabling me and undermining his authority. My father became even more irate when my grandfather refused to back down and stood up for me. Declaring he would never talk to them again, he stormed away. I was devastated to see my grandfather, who was normally composed, trembling with rage following that altercation. When my father began getting in touch with my place of employment, things got worse. He made outrageous charges about my inappropriate behavior and unstable mental state in emails he sent to my manager and the human resources department. He even made an attempt to persuade them that I was giving competitors access to company secrets. Fortunately, my manager has been understanding and my work history speaks for itself. However, the strain is having an adverse effect. It has been embarrassing for me to have to explain these private matters to my staff. Then my granddad unexpectedly died yesterday. The agony is intolerable. He was more than simply my grandfather. He was also my confidant, my guardian, and the one who always had faith in me. The fact that my parents did not attend the funeral only makes it worse. They had left town. Later, when I was organizing my grandfather's funeral, I discovered through my cousin that they were actually on vacation, sharing photos from a beach resort on Facebook. Every happy picture they shared made my heart ache. Taking an emergency leave of absence from his job, Michael flew in to support me during this trying period. My parents appeared out of nowhere as soon as he got to my grandparents' house. As though Michael's presence was somehow improper, my father icily inquired as to why he was there. I eventually lost my temper at that point. I asked them who they believed had taken care of all the funeral planning, who had supported grandma during her most trying time, who had stayed up late planning the ceremony, calling family, and interacting with the funeral home while they were taking selfies on the beach. Then, in an unsettling development, my father's entire personality altered. A disturbing peace took the place of the rage in his eyes. He became oddly calm and said he wanted to forgive me for what had happened with James and let the past be the past. He said he would let me stay with grandma, but only if he got what was rightfully his. I understood exactly what he was after, therefore I was horrified by the abrupt change in his demeanor. My grandfather had been quietly successful with his investments over the last few years. 
My father desired his inheritance because he had accumulated a sizable nest egg. He had the gall to come and demand money after everything they had done to us and after leaving us during the funeral. He was unaware, however, that Grandpa had anticipated this. While organizing Grandpa's study the day following the death, we discovered a note hidden in his desk drawer. All it said was, call Bob. Bob, who had visited him multiple times over the years, was both his lawyer and an old friend. We found out that Grandpa had left everything to me when we got in touch with him. I now owned every cent of his savings. Grandma would always have a place to live, protected from anyone who would try to take it away from her, thanks to the house being signed off to her. My father broke his cool exterior when I told him this. As he accused me of controlling Grandpa and turning him against his own son, his face flushed with anger. He went on a tirade about how he deserved his parents' money and how he had always supported them. He was the one who had left his family to pursue his greed, so it was almost comical that he was accusing me of deception. In an attempt to persuade me, my mother said things like, didn't you try to take away your sister's happiness? You now wish for us to suffer as well. However, I refused to back down. Grandpa had made up his mind, and I was going to respect it. I clarified that Grandpa had only recognized where their priorities lay and that Bob, his attorney, could confirm all I said. I also said that there was no conspiracy. The tension in the air was oppressive as they departed. As I watched them leave, I felt both relief and grief. Relief that Grandpa had kept us safe even when he was not around and sadness that my connection with my parents had reached a breaking point. I'm now concentrating on reconstructing my life and caring for Grandma. Throughout it all, Michael has been amazing, offering consolation and support when I needed it most. However, I can't help but wonder whether there was anything I could have done differently to avoid all of this suffering. Reddit I realize this post is lengthy, but I had to get everything out. Everything has become more problematic because of the inheritance situation and I'm worried that my parents might try something extreme. I would be grateful for any guidance on legal protection. Has anyone else experienced a similar situation? How did you respond to it? Update 1. Things took a turn for the worst a few days after my last update. Apparently not satisfied with simply pestering my workplace, my father has begun reaching out to our company's customers. I learned this when a representative from one of our largest clients pulled me aside in a virtual meeting to voice concerns about upsetting emails they had received about me. These emails were kindly forwarded by them. My father was methodically attempting to damage my work relationships after he somehow managed to obtain our client list. According to the emails, I was a volatile individual who was stealing business secrets and taking advantage of older family members for financial gain. The fact that he disclosed information regarding customer projects that he shouldn't have known about is very troubling. Now since he works for a partner company, I'm wondering if James was giving him false information. The legal department of my business has been engaged. In addition to the possible harm to my reputation, they are taking this extremely seriously because my father's activities are endangering business partnerships. My parents received a cease and desist letter from them, which only appears to have made them more angry. My parents have responded by launching a full-scale campaign against me on social media. In order to disseminate their story, they have made numerous phony personas in addition to publishing on their own ones. The stories they are narrating are getting more complex. They now assert that I have been deliberately deceiving my grandfather for years and that I somehow planned out his whole investing strategy to suit my own interests. They are unaware that I discovered something startling while looking through more of grandpa's documents. Classic grandpa, always the meticulous planner, had a secret compartment in his desk drawer that held a USB drive and a pile of papers along with comprehensive documentation of what seems to be systematic tax fraud and money laundering through my father's real estate business, the USB drive included years worth of email correspondence between him and multiple offshore accounts. I informed grandpa's attorney, Bob, about these results right away. He wasn't surprised, which was an odd response. Grandpa had apparently been gathering this information for years, recording each dubious business transaction and suspicious activity. Even photos of meetings with well-known dishonest business people were included in the folder. Bob clarified that Grandpa had been assembling evidence but was holding off on taking action until the perfect time. A set of emails revealing that my father had been embezzling money from his own parents' accounts for years was the most upsetting finding. Probably thinking they wouldn't notice, he had managed to get access to their financial portfolio and had started taking little amounts out. Grandpa did notice though, and instead of confronting him right away, he decided to record everything. To examine all the evidence, Bob is currently collaborating with a group of forensic accountants. According to him, we have more than enough to possibly file criminal charges in addition to defending against any legal claims my parents might make. I have mixed feelings about this. 
While I desire justice, I still find it difficult to imagine my own father being charged with a crime. James's eagerness to return to my parents' house is further clarified by the evidence. He and my father exchange a number of emails about business prospects that seem eerily similar to Ponzi scams. I'm beginning to question whether the entire charge that I attempted to woo James was a preemptive move, meant to discredit me should I ever find out what they were doing. In the meantime, my mother has started calling my grandmother every day, alternating between threatening her and guilt-tripping her. The most recent strategy is asserting that my father's health is suffering due to the stress of my betrayal, and that I will be held accountable if anything were to happen to him. On Bob's recommendation, my grandmother, God bless her, has begun recording these calls. We've put in new cybersecurity procedures and placed security cameras throughout the house to keep ourselves safe. Bob suggested that I freeze my credit and assisted me in securing all of my accounts. When my parents see their intimidation strategies aren't working, he fears they may attempt a financial retaliation. My job has been suffering due to the stress, but in a surprising turn of events, this has improved my standing inside the organization. My manager has been tremendously supportive after seeing the proof of my father's harassment campaign. My application for a completely remote job has been expedited, so I won't ever have to worry about working from my parents' house again. Throughout it all, Michael has been my pillar of support. In a spare room at my grandmother's house, he has assisted me in setting up a safe home office with backup systems and secured communications. We're also talking seriously about his moving to a job nearer to me, but I'm concerned that this would make my parents even more of a target. To help me cope with everything, I've started going to a therapist. She is assisting me in realizing that I am not to blame for anything and that it is acceptable to feel both love and resentment for my parents. Processing the knowledge that the folks who raised you are not who you believe them to be is a difficult process. We are currently awaiting the completion of the forensic accountant's analysis. Within a few weeks, Bob continues, we should have a good picture of the scope of my father's financial crimes. I'm getting ready for whatever might happen next. My parents, who know me well, will not tolerate this. I appreciate your prior support, Reddit. I never thought my family's drama would reveal something so significant. Has anybody else learned that their parents committed financial crimes? How did you decide whether or not to report them? I'd really appreciate some advice on this. Update 2. Emily arrived at our home this morning without warning. As I prepared myself for another altercation, I saw a broken lady instead of rage. Her normally flawless appearance was unkempt, and her eyes were red and puffy. She broke down in tears before I could even inquire what was wrong. She sobbed and told what had transpired. James had been in Chicago on a purported work trip. Emily had flown out to his hotel in order to surprise him. She believed a romantic gesture may help ease her feelings of insecurity over their relationship. Rather, she entered his room and found him with another lady. It wasn't the worst part though. Emily insisted on seeing his phone during their heated argument. The whole story of our family was broken by what she discovered. The offensive messages that had caused me to be expelled. I never made them. To escape suspicion, James had kept one of his mistress's phone numbers under my name. Using my name as a front for at least three different women, he had been having several encounters. The most startling aspect of all was perhaps how our parents reacted when Emily told them this information. Rather than offering their heartbroken daughter assistance, they advised her to remain silent and try to resolve the situation with James. They cared less about Emily's happiness and more about keeping up appearances. To spare the family the shame of a divorce, they even advised her to forgive him. Then Emily found something much more unsettling. She discovered emails on James's laptop that showed he and our father had been involved in more than just family affairs. Together, they had established a number of shell corporations to conceal funds from investors and taxes. James has been directing contracts to these shells at exorbitant pricing by virtue of his position at his company. Accounts in Switzerland and the Cayman Islands were found via the money trail. Emily discovered pictures of James having meetings with strangers, all of which were stored in a secret folder called insurance. James appears to have kept records of everything, most likely for protection against any attempts to expose him. Another realization dawned on me as Emily told me these specifics. Not only was the inheritance at the center of the recent harassment of my clients and workplace, but it was also a frantic attempt to discredit me before I might learn of their financial machinations. They thought I might eventually find their digital trail because I work in technology. My sister is currently residing at grandma's house with us. She is working with Bob to document what she has discovered and has filed for divorce. In addition to harming James, the data she presented could have disastrous consequences for our father. She discovered certain transactions that were exactly in line with the documents grandpa had been gathering. The irony of it all? For years, James had been living beyond his means, 
using the proceeds of these illicit operations to fund his numerous affairs. In addition to wanting to be near James's place of employment, they moved back in with our parents since they were having financial difficulties as a result of his extravagant spending on his covert life. Through all of this, Emily has shown incredible bravery. She has already discussed her findings with the FBI, who are especially curious about the financial fraud's global components. She has been informed by the investigators that this case may be worth millions of dollars. Our parents' approach has entirely altered. They are now attempting to argue that they were duped by James and were unaware of the true situation. However, the data points to a different conclusion. Documents we have discovered reveal that our father was the mastermind behind numerous of these plots, with James acting as the frontman for his business. Emily is suffering from the stress of it all. For the first time in our adult lives, we have been spending evenings discussing things, and she has begun visiting her own therapist. She has repeatedly expressed regret for not trusting me and for allowing James and our parents to influence her. Since she was just as much a victim of their manipulation as I was, I have forgiven her. Grandma has been incredible during this entire ordeal. She said Emily needed the master bedroom more than anyone else at the moment, so she gave it to her. We've resumed having dinners as a family, just the three of us and Michael when he comes over. It's amazing how tragedy can unite people and forge new ties from the ashes of past ones. Our cooperation is complete and the FBI inquiry is still going on. Our parents are still working to preserve their reputation in the neighborhood and have engaged pricey attorneys, but more people are discovering the truth every day. Our father's former business partners have begun to come out with their own accounts of dubious activities. Sometimes Reddit, the reality is more amazing than you might think. I'm finally with my sister again, and we're stronger together than we were before. We're getting ready for what is probably going to be a protracted court struggle, but at least we're doing it together as a family. A true family founded on support and truth rather than deceit and manipulation. Has anyone else experienced a similar situation where revealing a single family secret revealed a whole network of dishonesty? How did you handle the fallout? Update 3. The pace of progress has exceeded everyone's expectations. The FBI intervened last Friday morning when my father and James were enjoying their customary business breakfast at their preferred high-end eatery. I will never forget the expressions on their faces as they were carried out in handcuffs directly in front of the city's most affluent business community. In an instant, their meticulously constructed image of prosperous business people fell apart. Teams attacked their offices, our parents' home and a number of storage units we were unaware existed as part of the coordinated raid that took place in numerous locations at once. They discovered proof of a three-continent money laundering scheme, offshore account details, and decades' worth of fake documents. Over $50 million is the preliminary estimate of the whole scam. However, that wasn't even the most fulfilling aspect. Do you recall the pictures James had saved for insurance? As it happens, he wasn't the only one who kept records. Three of his ex-girlfriends came forward with pictures, emails, and text conversations dating back years. They had been silently constructing their own case and were all aware of one another. The finest aspect. For months they had been collaborating with the FBI. James's recent business travels were watched, and every transaction was recorded. As one might anticipate, my mother's response to the arrest was quite predictable. She made an effort to play the victim by saying she was unaware of their illicit actions. When the FBI disclosed that they had recordings of her actively engaging in money laundering through her charitable foundation, that story completely collapsed. All those lavish galas she held to raise money. Simple plots to wash up shady finances. There has been extensive media coverage. The story was carried by all local news channels and even by several national ones. Prominent businessmen and son-in-law arrested in multi-million dollar fraud scheme. The headlines continued to appear. Overnight, my father's meticulously cultivated reputation as a community leader and benefactor was destroyed. The reaction from their social circle was fast and harsh. Those who once admired them at charity functions now act as though they had never met them. Their church requested that they resign from all committees, and the country club cancelled their membership. In an effort to protect their own reputations, former business partners are going out of their way to assist the authorities. James's business quickly distanced itself from the situation. He was fired right away, and they are completely assisting with the investigation. As it seems, he had also been defrauding them by inflating contracts and keeping the difference for himself. His name has become poisonous in the sector, and his professional reputation has been utterly wrecked. What the forensic accountants at the FBI discovered made me laugh aloud. Grandpa left that property in the trust in Florida. It was more than simply a dilapidated house, it held the secret to their whole scheme. Grandpa had purchased it especially to serve as evidence after learning that it was being used as a front for money laundering. 
He was aware that the property inquiry would reveal everything if they attempted to challenge the will. Even from the afterlife, he played them like a chess master. James and my father both agreed to plea bargains last week. The punishment is severe, my father will serve 15 years in federal prison, James will serve 12 years, and all assets related to their crimes will be forfeited. For the remainder of their lives, they will both be making restitution. Next month, my mother will be sentenced to 8 to 10 years in prison for her involvement in the money laundering conspiracy. After all of this, Emily is stronger than ever. She started her own business with the settlement, which was the little money left over after asset forfeiture, once the divorce was finalized. We've never been closer since she moved into a comfortable apartment close to grandma's house. Our parents worked very hard to sever the sister link, but it has since become indestructible. There was more karma to come. Do you recall how my parents attempted to ruin my reputation in the workplace? The board of my organization was so pleased with my handling of the matter that they elevated me to the position of director of security operations. I now oversee a group of people that work to stop the exact type of scam that James and my father perpetrated. Last month, Michael relocated here. And we recently purchased a home a few blocks away from grandma. By the way, she's doing fantastically. She used her experience to help others by starting a support group for families impacted by financial fraud. What about the valuable social standing of my mother? When I last heard from her, her old pals were openly avoiding her while she was shopping at the bargain grocery store. Her friends have made it apparent that she is no longer welcome in their group, and her expensive jewelry and clothing have all been confiscated. According to Reddit, justice isn't always served without flawless karma. Despite going through a lot my family has emerged stronger, closer and wiser. I want to express my gratitude to everyone who helped me along the way. And to everyone who has experienced similar betrayals in their family, never give up. When the truth finally surfaces, it's a magnificent moment. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real life stories happening around you. My mom kicked me out for her new family, then demanded college money for my siblings when she found out I'm successful. To put things in perspective, my mother gave birth to me at the age of 20, and my biological father was never involved. He never wanted children, she told me, and because they had only been dating for a few months when she became pregnant, she offered him the option to leave, which he did. She stated that because of the bitterness of their breakup, she had chosen not to demand child support from him and he had also refused to pay. Never talking again was convenient for both of them. She was fortunate to have my grandparents' unwavering support and encouragement, which enabled her to finish her schooling and secure employment. She dated a couple men while I was younger, and she began dating Harry, a co-worker, when I was about eight years old. Before getting married, they dated for over three years. Although we weren't very close, Harry and I got along well enough to put up with each other being in the house. When my mom became pregnant four years after they were married, everyone was overjoyed, including me. In retrospect, I probably should have known what was going to happen, but I was too preoccupied with the idea that my mother would always support me. I hoped mom wouldn't leave me now because she had endured a lot of challenges raising me by herself. She obviously distanced herself from me after she married Harry, and we began to drift apart, but I thought it was only a phase and that things would improve. During her pregnancy, I did my best to be encouraging, but she appeared to get angrier every time I was there. To avoid disturbing her, I made the decision to become scarce, but it seems that I wasn't inconspicuous enough. She and Harry sat me down for a serious conversation six months after she gave birth to twins. They informed me that they couldn't keep me in the house since they had two children to look after. They couldn't legally throw me out without getting in trouble because I was still a juvenile, having just turned 16. By highlighting the financial burden of providing for a big family, on their meager income, they attempted to persuade me otherwise. Since we had been living comfortably up until that point, I honestly didn't think it was hard to maintain two adults, one teenager and two kids on the salary of two web engineers. They clearly only wanted me gone. I genuinely didn't want to leave, so even at that point I attempted to offer ways to stop it. If money was a problem, I offered to acquire a job, but my mother said she wanted to save money and resources for the children who deserved it more. She stated that they asterisk deserved asterisk to stay with them more than I did, not that they asterisk needed asterisk this more. That was all it took for me to decide that I had to leave because it was obvious that no one wanted me. They knew I had enough dignity to know I was unwanted, so they had only nudged me in the right way after I left, without even telling me where I should go. Their strategy was successful. Since they hadn't really evicted me, it wasn't technically an eviction, but I would still consider it to be the same. I felt like I had no other choice after they had forced me into a difficult situation. I went straight to my grandparents' house when I left that day. 
They wanted to be there for the twins, so even though they were upset about what my mother had done, they didn't cut her off. At 16 I obtained part-time work because I could no longer financially rely on my grandparents due to their advanced age. When my mom and Harry went to visit my grandparents with the kids, I would see them every now and then, but they seldom ever inquired about me. They tended to be very formal, as if they didn't miss me at all, even when they did see me. They actually appeared to be happy without my presence. I was saddened by my mother's apparent decrease in irritability, but I knew there was nothing I could do about it. Until it was time to go to college, I lived with my grandparents. My mom wasn't involved with me even then, so I had to rely on friends to assist me get settled in my dorm because my grandparents weren't old enough or healthy enough. My mom and Harry declined, preferring to preserve money for the twins' future, so I had to take out a student loan, and one of my relatives co-signed for it. Fortunately, one of my uncles agreed to assist if I assured him that he would never be responsible for any of the costs. I worked while I was in college to make sure I wouldn't fall behind on my payments and to give myself a financial advantage. My mother and I hardly spoke once I started college, and only my grandparents were present when I graduated. Not even my mother bothered to congratulate me. In order to avoid being a burden to my elderly grandparents, I began working and lived independently after college. Although I didn't make much money during the first few years, I was still able to pay for groceries, utilities, rent and even started to pay off my debt while setting money up for the future. In fact, I would describe asterisk that asterisk as living on a limited income. Fortunately, things finally got better. It took a while, but I eventually rose through the ranks of my organization. Considering that I received very little assistance, I'm proud of how far I've gone and am now in a rather comfortable posture. Unexpectedly, my mother discovered that I earn a good living, even though we haven't spoken for many years. At nearly 33, I currently hold a senior management role at the same organization where I began my career. About four months ago, I got a big promotion, but I wanted to keep it a secret, so only a select few individuals knew about it. To thank my uncle for co-signing my loan back when I was having trouble paying for college, I did inform him. According to what I understand, he just met my mom and Harry at a family get-together and urged her to get in touch with me to congratulate me on my success. Even though I'm sure he meant well, it didn't work out because she didn't even get in touch with me to offer me congratulations. In the end, my mother learned about it and recently visited my home with Harry, insisting on talking to me. I should note that I haven't spoken to her since I started college. I blocked her everywhere and left her out of my life after graduating since I didn't think there was any use in hoping she would change her mind. She didn't appear to be negatively impacted, and to be honest, I doubt she even noticed. Only my grandparents, who were aware that I disliked discussing my mother, were in contact with me and they steered clear of the subject. I didn't really stay in touch with my uncle either, so I was unaware that my mom and Harry had been having financial difficulties for a few years. Only when they arrived at my door and told me how bad things had gotten did I find out. It was wishful thinking, but the only reason I even allowed them inside was because I hoped they would be coming to make amends. They began by stating that they had heard from my uncle about my promotion and how I was one of the youngest individuals in such a prominent position in my firm, rather than congratulating me on my accomplishment. It seems that they were surprised that I had kept it from them. Ironically, I was taken aback that they expected me to communicate with them at all, much less deliver any positive news. Additionally, they were disappointed that I had shut them out of my life, claiming that it was only because they had prioritized their children above me. They maintained that I should have been old enough to comprehend their rearranged priorities and not harbor resentment as a teenager. They said that I should have supported their decisions rather than going in with my grandparents. I'm not even sure why they thought I would agree with their choice to expel me from the house. They tried to gaslight me into thinking that I was the bad guy for being angry that they had ejected me so they could spend time with their children alone, but that's how they began our reunion after all these years. They talked about how tough the past several years had been for them without even giving me a chance to explain my side of the story. They described how they had launched their own company but, regrettably, it did not succeed, resulting in losses. They were now attempting to make up for previous losses, and they desperately needed money as the twins were getting close to college age. I saw then why they had come. They needed financial assistance. They didn't waste any time going right to the point, even trying to soften it by claiming that I could make it up to them by paying for my siblings' schooling, but that at first they were upset that I hadn't contacted them despite performing well. Their attempt to make it seem as though they were doing asterisk me asterisk a favor by allowing me to pay for the college education of two children I no longer knew astounded me. I told them right away that I wouldn't be doing that and that it was disrespectful of them to believe they could coerce me into doing so. I became irate and reminded them that they were the reason I had to work during my college years and pay for my own education. 
Because they wanted to save for their real children, who they believed deserved it more than I did, they had refused to provide me with financial support back then. I assured them that they had no right to expect anything from me now, particularly financial support, since I had never questioned their choice to put the twins first and had just left them alone. They actually no longer had the right to demand that I communicate with them. Instead of attempting to emotionally control me, I pointed out that they could now use the same money to pay for the twins' college bills because they had wished to conserve money and resources for the children who deserved it. I had nothing else to say, so I asked them to go. I was stupid to invite them inside my house in the first place, assuming they might have come to express regret for their treatment of me. They became irritated and attempted to place the blame elsewhere when I began to insist that they leave. They informed me that I wasn't innocent in this case. Their protection. They said I was over-enthusiastic, over-involved, and frequently irritable while we all lived together. I was only a teenager, trying to keep in touch with my family as they drifted away from me, so I couldn't believe that was a true issue they had with me. They then had the audacity to claim that I was no better than them since I had denied their request. They said I was forgetting all the years my mother had taken care of me and brought me up alone. They said that this was my opportunity to make it up to her, and a sister, but I was being rude and unappreciative instead. Since I was a child at the time, I thought it was absurd that they would bring that up. Even if I had wanted to, I couldn't have decided not to rely on them. Furthermore, it wasn't like they were helping me. They pushed me out of the house and effectively forced me out as soon as they believed I was mature enough to manage things on my own. For the following 18 years, they refused to acknowledge my existence. I was still shocked that they had the gall to expect me to aid them now, as if I owed them something, even after everything that had happened. During the dispute, things became quite personal and ugly, and I finally threatened to call the police if they didn't leave my property. My mother reminded me of all the sacrifices she had made when I was younger, ostensibly because she wanted to be a good mother, before they finally departed after more arguments. She said that I had been ungrateful the one time she had expected me to sympathize with her predicament and allow her to put other people before myself. She now claimed that rather than the other way around, I was portraying her as the villain. Since then, this has been bothering me and I'm having trouble figuring out whether I'm to blame, whether I've been expecting too much from my mother, or whether she's simply deceiving me. I decided to post on Reddit to get some unbiased perspectives even though I'm quite sure I'm correct. AITA for not paying for my half-siblings college tuition just because my stepdad and estranged mother are having financial difficulties. Edit. Even though my uncle had excellent intentions, I reminded him that what he did was wrong and unacceptable. His actions undoubtedly had a negative effect. I wouldn't be in this predicament if he hadn't shared my life with my mother and disclosed my contact details without my consent. He apologized excessively stating that he was unaware of their financial difficulties and that he had no idea my mother would respond in this manner. He admitted that he had no business telling my mother about my life and that if we had wanted to get back together, we would have done so without his help. Since his heart was in the right place, I don't intend to cut him out of my life. I would have been much more angry if he had meant something different. He simply made an error. In addition, it was because of him that I was initially able to attend college. He was the only person who was prepared to assume the responsibility of co-signing my loan application. If you consider it, I might not be in this situation at all if it weren't for him. I made sure to let him know that what he did wasn't appropriate since I don't want to come across as unappreciative, but I'm also not a doormat. Whatever I did was fair enough, and I believe I found the ideal balance. We're doing great together. And I won't hold anything against him because I needed this resolution somehow. I also discussed my mom's recent struggles with my grandparents. They believe I'm correct and have promised to make an effort to persuade her to change her mind. I realize that they didn't want to lose touch with their other grandchildren, which is why they have remained in touch with my mom. They understand the struggles my mom's family is going through, but they don't think it's right or fair to put me through this. That's their position on the issue and I believe it's reasonable enough. Asterisk asterisk. First update. My mother has taken it upon herself to remind me of all she did for me growing up ever since we last spoke which was nearly nine days ago. She probably sends me an email every other day to make me feel like I owe her something. It's not like she gave me a favor by raising me alone, and she was legally required to take care of me, so I don't really understand the point. She only reared me when it was convenient for her. She and her spouse decided to expel me as soon as I started to cause them trouble, citing the need to save money for the twins and their future. Now that we're in the future and the twins are adults, I believe they should rely on themselves rather than wasting time trying to manipulate and guilt trip me. Although I had been ignoring her emails, I made the decision to reply a few days ago. I explained to her all I had written in my essay. 
She didn't take it well, as expected, and labeled me ungrateful once more. I just informed her that calling me names would not alter the truth and that I no longer wanted to have any contact with her because she had been a bad mother. I blocked her email account after that, but she made a new one to continue to annoy me. Since she never done the same for me, I blocked that one as well, and I'll keep doing so until she understands that I'm not here to mope about her. To be honest, I'm glad we're finally having this discussion because I think it will end quickly and I'll have the necessary closure. Only because I was still clinging to the hope that perhaps they had changed that perhaps they were here to congratulate me and make amends, did I welcome them into my house and talk to them that day. However, speaking with them made me realize that they are just not the type of individuals who are able to experience regret, guilt or shame. I've fully given up on ever making amends with them after it one again made me realize how self-centered and cunning they are. Second update. I believe that my mother's appearance at my place of employment earlier today was the most bizarre thing she has ever done. Fortunately, I wasn't working today so she departed really fast and didn't succeed in her endeavor. I was feeling a little under the weather, so I decided to take the day off, and I'm so happy I did. She would have definitely thrown a fit or done anything to make me look foolish if I'd been present. When the receptionist called to inform me that my mom had arrived, wanting to see me and refusing to go despite being informed that I wasn't there, I learned the truth. When they put her on the phone with me, I firmly told her that I was at home, even though I was already rather anxious about what she might do. She was informed that if she attempted anything at my place of employment, I would sue her until she would be too ashamed to send her children to college. I did my best to sound threatening, so I believe it truly frightened her. She agreed to depart right away, provided I met her in person, so it must have worked. I reminded her that she couldn't afford a lawsuit at the moment and informed her that she wasn't in a position to be making demands. I also mentioned that my employer would not think twice about suing her if the situation worsened, which would be a very different scenario because they wouldn't be as forgiving as I'd been. She'd be better off just going out in silence. I didn't get any more calls or notifications regarding the event, so I guess she left after giving the phone back to the receptionist. I can't afford for this to happen again because that was undoubtedly a near call. I've made the decision to speak with a lawyer to find out what precautions I may take. She hasn't threatened me directly, so I'm not sure if this is enough to get a restraining order, but I still want to speak with the attorney to discuss my alternatives. I just have to hope that this experience was unpleasant enough for her to think about leaving me alone till then. Update 3. Since I'm very certain we now have grounds for a restraining order, I suppose I don't need to consider filing one. When my mother arrived at my place of employment last week, I was able to persuade her to leave. However, in light of this week's events, I believe that a restraining order against her needs to be issued for everyone. She was waiting outside my door when I got home from work a few days ago. I informed her right away that I didn't want to argue and that I would call the police if she didn't leave. She practically raced at me and threw me to the ground, sending my phone flying out of my hands as I was ready to dial. She cursed at me and blamed me for everything that had gone wrong in her life, while she attempted to beat me up. It took me a while to react since I was so taken aback by her insane conduct. However, because I consistently work out and am much younger than her, it was simple for me to overwhelm her when I did. Fortunately, all the shouting had alerted my neighbors to the problem and caused them to call the police. They even came to my aid and restrained my mother as we awaited the arrival of the cops. I made the decision to file charges when the police eventually arrived. She is currently in a lot of trouble. In addition, I've discussed this with my attorney and requested a restraining order against her. I've been informed that Harry has taken the children and moved in with his parents. I'm not sure if he intends to come back anytime soon. He apparently challenged her about her behavior after saving her and informed her that she couldn't continue acting in this manner. She also got into a fight with him, which seems to mean she's really lost it. I believe she finds it difficult to believe that I'm doing well in life, but in all honesty, she is to blame for her own issues. I will not be sorry for her. I'll have the restraining order in place soon, and since I'm making more money, I've already started thinking about moving into a larger home. Since now seems like the ideal moment, I'm going to start exploring my alternatives. Being linked to someone like that is embarrassing, so I sincerely hope my mother receives the support she needs and learns to behave normally. She has also been nasty to my grandparents, who have told me they no longer want to be around her. The only person she can blame for everyone avoiding her is herself. Anyway, I'm not worried about it anymore. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real life stories happening around you. My brother once threatened to kill me, my husband, and our children. He was sentenced to a year in prison but will be released soon. What should I do? Hi everyone, 
I'm so grateful to this community and the incredible support. I'm posting this to update you about our case. My brother called and threatened to kill me and my husband and kids about two months ago. He also has a history of getting guns, an axe, and other supplies with plans to commit other murders. He has hurt a dog sexually when he was younger, but did not hurt people yet. It has been horrible and difficult and I'm not sure that I could have survived emotionally without my friends, colleagues and this community. You gave me amazing advice. We are moving this upcoming weekend. My husband has been more supportive with the move, even though he still feels that he could take on my brother. I'm not interested in physically confronting my brother. I don't want to live in constant fear. Meds and the psych hospital didn't help him, I think the only thing that will help is a long-term inpatient unit but our state doesn't have those resources. My brother was released from the hospital straight to jail. He currently awaits his court date in May. I met with the prosecutor today and gave my statement. They put his bail at half a million, the highest the detective I've been working with has seen for a misdemeanor. His lawyer requested to lower it but the judge refused to lower the bail amount. I was told the judge is aware of his previous serious plans and preparations to kill. The prosecutor plans to go for the most jail time possible for this, a year. I don't know if jail is right for him but if he is released he will hurt someone. I spoke with my dad, and he was so mad at me for speaking with the police. He kept saying how my brother was asking for help and sharing his fantasies with me, not threatening me. He kept telling me to withdraw my statement. He said that I'm the one that put my brother in jail. It broke my heart. I told my dad that I only told the police the truth. I told him my brother is sick and will hurt someone. My dad said, you don't have a crystal ball. True. But he's made his intentions clear again and again and again. His doctor said he has no empathy. His only thrill is thinking about hurting others. The prosecutor said that even if I withdraw my complaint the state is still bringing these charges. The social worker and prosecutor said this to my parents, but my dad, mom, and sister keep insisting that I need to recant my statement. I'm terrified of every small noise in the house. We are leaving our friends and everyone we know and moving because of my brother's actions. I feel so heartbroken that my dad and family are blind to it. Everyone else, police and medical staff included, can see the clear writing on the wall. Relevant comments. Commenter, please keep your location private from your family. While they downplay the threat your brother poses, they're a risk. I can easily see them disclosing your new location to him just to prove he's not a danger. OP posted about her relationship struggles with her husband, please help me stay in my marriage. I'm losing my patience. Married for eight years. We have three kids, seven to two years old. We both work full time. Recently we had to move due to a safety issue. My husband did not want to leave and made me feel crazy for wanting to flee for our safety. Our already fragile marriage feels unstable with the added stress of moving. My husband is on the spectrum and I thought that working from home would help him be less stressed and more kind. But he is unhappy, unkind yelling at me and the kids, and generally questioning any decision or request I make. I made a compromise when I married him, knowing that I did not like his sense of humor or sex with him, but thinking that his intelligence and our common values would get us through. Now I feel stuck because I don't feel like our values are the same anymore. He wants material possessions. He hates meeting new people. He can't tolerate the noise and chaos our kids bring. I don't mind the chaos and noise, that's just kids. I love minimalism. To me a stranger is just a friend I haven't met yet. I'm making new friends every day out here, and he's refusing to meet anyone new in our new city. I love being at work because I feel valued and appreciated. I love being with my kids or my friends for the same reason. But I dread every interaction with my husband. When he's gone for several days I feel so happy because no one is criticizing me or yelling at the kids. He's on depression and ADHD meds and in counseling, but I don't think it has helped. Having known him for this long I know he isn't changing. I keep trying to convince myself to stay. I want to stay for our kids. I don't want to ruin their lives. I'm just so very unhappy with constantly managing his feelings. I don't care if I will be alone my whole life. I don't care if I'll ever be loved. I just don't want to feel miserable. But I need to stay for our children. I feel so lost. I just want to not feel bad. Relevant comments. Commenter, why do you need to stay for the children? What good is it for them to be exposed to this? OP, I've dated people before that had these qualities but didn't match on values, or ended up doing something that hurt me. I made a decision to marry my husband knowing we matched well on most things. But since having kids he has become angry. Activities that we used to enjoy together he no longer enjoys. He used to make me feel special. I'm hoping that things change and he becomes happy and fun again. Update 1, we have three young kids and we both work full time. 
We moved to a high cost of living location and my husband has encouraged me to get a second job because I have a profession that pays well. I told him that I enjoy working and I do, but I manage appointments for the kids and already feel stretched thin. I use lunch breaks to pick up meds for the kids or make phone calls for appointments for the family. My days off are used to take kids to appointments. I clean the house in the evenings. I let him know he'd have to take over the appointment coordinator role, start cooking more, and do more childcare if I'm working 50 or more hours a week. Well, I got off of work at 7 tonight and ran by the pharmacy to pick up our son's prescription. I was there over my lunch hour, but they messed it up so I came back after work. The line was long and I texted him updates. By 8 something I got the med and drove home. He was pissed because he took the kids to Costco for dinner and one accidentally dropped their food. I got home in time to help with bedtime while my husband yelled at the kids and told me he can't handle it. He said he could handle things if I actually made it home at a reasonable time. I'm kind of, dumbstruck. Does he want me to work more or take care of the kids? I can't do both, and I told him this ahead of time. When we met he told me that he wanted kids and I agreed to have kids. I love our children. I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, but he told me that would stress him too much. I'm now feeling forced to work but still having to pick up the slack at home. Relevant comments. Commenter, sounds like your job is already tough getting off that late in the evening. Does he work and do you have daytime childcare? If he can't handle a single evening with the kids I'd be concerned about him having to do that most nights. What a whiner. He's going to have to toughen up and get some better parenting skills and patience because parenting doesn't necessarily get easier, just different, as the kids get older. OP, we do daycare. I'm a healthcare provider and my job gives me a lot of satisfaction, but we recently had to move for safety reasons. I'm the one that forced us to move because I was fearful for the kids' lives. The job I took promised full time but ended up only having 30 hours a week, so I'm now picking up extra days at another clinic and interviewed to work at an urgent care on the side. Our son has severe ADHD and anxiety. I had to get all the doctor appointments scheduled, find school and daycare for the kids, get us into a protective program, take the kids to appointments, etc. My husband doesn't cook and he yells at the kids. He is in counseling but it sounds like the major thing the counselor said to him was that he has to take time for himself. I thought that was wild. I have done my best to keep us afloat. My husband kept his old job but it doesn't pay as well and he has to drive back to the old house to fix it up to sell. The drive is eight hours each way, so I'm caring for the kids on my own weekly. I'm struggling. We don't have family here so not much support. Writing this out makes me feel like maybe I'm a dummy for doing this and not putting my foot down but I signed up for counseling and it was a disaster. The therapist told me to stop having expectations and to not complain and then proceeded to argue with my husband. Commenter. Dude, there are a lot of bad therapists out there so please don't let that deter you. We had to go through a few before getting one that worked for us. I couldn't believe the internalized misogyny and blatant sexism of many. The worst one didn't take insurance so we were paying $200-WK for one session. She was obsessed with his family and how they were the image of perfection. She asked if she could meet his parents. She also told me that I should not have expectations. It should be clearly communicate and discuss expectations. She told me I was not allowed to bring up relationship issues. She would only ask me to listen to him and validate his feelings. It goes on and on. Do not let someone speak to you like this. Your feelings are valid, and find a new therapist if you are told otherwise. OP, wow, did we see the same therapist? It was almost verbatim what this therapist said to us. I'm the one that booked the appointment and filled out, not even joking, the 39 mandatory forms before the appointment. She berated me for filling out all the forms myself. Before any input or questions, she pointed to my unhappiness in our marriage from the filled out forms, and told me that I clearly overthink things and talk too much. Yeah you had 39 mandatory forms. Of course it's a lot. Update 2, quick recap on her previous situation and thanks the community for their support. I want to let you know we are safe. We are in our new state. My husband is trying his best and being far more supportive. He still believes we should have stayed to fight, but he's accepted the fact I felt the threat was real. The kids are adjusting to life in our new state. We made some friends. Our location is not public despite my license to practice medicine being available online, it is far from the first result and our address is hidden. My employer is very respectful and kept my name off of the clinic list of providers. I've signed up for address protection through our state, this is thanks to many of you who advised me to move and hide our address. I appreciate all your kind advice. I am flying back to our old state today to testify against my brother tomorrow.
he decided to go for a jury trial on advice from my parents. I'm an anxious mess and have tons of conflicting feelings. I helped raise my brother and a large part of my identity has been helping and protecting my siblings. A small part of me feels that testifying against him, and sharing everything I know, will destroy his life and be a betrayal. But I know he made his bed and must have consequences. It's the right thing to do as shitty as it feels. The boy I helped raise is not there anymore. He is not the same person that sexually abused a dog, that has threatened to shoot up a hospital pediatric unit, stab my sisters, kill my parents with an axe, or kill me and my husband and kids with a sledgehammer. I dread seeing this man tomorrow. Every time his photo shows up on my phone I panic. Meeting people with the same name makes my heart beat faster. I can't stop feeling fear. I plan to tell the truth and let the jury decide if my brother is guilty. I worry that this will destroy what's left of my relationship with my family of origin. I have to do the right thing even if my parents and sisters think this is a betrayal of our family. My sister told me this will not change things between us, because she believes I will do the right thing for the family. But the truth is I plan on doing what's right for my family and the community. Again, I am grateful to you and will update you on how things go. Updated added via an edit. I just gave my testimony. My brother and mom were staring daggers into me but I did my best to keep calm. They only allowed me to testify about the threatening phone call, not about any of my brother's past history. Not about guns, axes, or dogs. Relevant comments. Commenter. You're doing the right thing. Congratulations to you for actually doing something and preventing a tragedy. You're awesome. I don't know about American law but is there a possibility to testify without the defendant in the room? Like, remove him from the room while you can testify. I've asked for this and I've seen it happen many times as a lawyer in another country. OP, I do not think there is a way to testify without my brother being in the room. I know that my family will also be there and in a way, knowing how much they do not want me to testify is the worst part. My family is Soviet with a history of alcoholism, abusive behaviors, and secrecy. I'm trying to break that cycle for my own kids and to raise them to tell the truth, even if it is difficult or scary. It's heartbreaking that my brother grew up to be this person and threw all of us into this horrible situation. I wish that I didn't have to go against my parents' wishes but I truly don't have a choice. Commenter, your brother is desperate for help. And your parents and sister want to ignore those cries for help because IDK they don't want to look bad. If your brother is released and hurts or kills someone, what then? OP, my parents were mad at me for taking him to a crisis center initially when he admitted to being suicidal. They thought I should have brought him home to them to take care of it themselves. I think their approach would have allowed him to hurt someone. They think him buying guns and an axe, and tactical gear and scoping where to shoot people is just fantasies he had. My dad said it's no different than watching one or two movies, or reading historical fiction. My parents also don't believe that he sexually abused their dog even though he admitted to it multiple times and the police and FBI told us about it and the social workers confirmed it. I didn't want to believe it either, but my brother admitted to it himself to my face and he looked very sheepish, and embarrassed that he did it. He didn't expect that his doctor would reveal it to the police but they did. My parents care more about their son and how the family looks than the actual well-being of their daughters or grandkids. Update 3. Hi everyone. Thank you again for your kind support. Here is a hopefully, final update. I testified against my brother today, in the case of threatening to kill me, my husband and our kids. My brother was found guilty. I gave a victim statement and my husband gave one virtually. I was able to provide more background on his past threats and guns and other weapons. My testimony at trial was very limited to the phone call, so it felt good to be able to say all the reasons we have to take him seriously. My mom gave a tearful character statement saying he was so gentle and would never hurt anyone. The judge cut her off mid-testimony, it was honestly so validating. He will be released from jail in two weeks to serve out his sentence of two years of probation with regular check-ins, mandated therapy and possibly having to wear a GPS tracker. The judge also extended the protective order for me and my husband and kids to four years. My mom is renting a hotel room for my brother once he's out of jail. They are trying to find a halfway house but it will most likely be not very secure. At least probation and mandated therapy should help, I hope. I do not plan on having any future contact with my brother. I will see if we have contact with my parents. I plan on still talking with my sisters. I've urged them to not share their addresses with our brother, but they are adults. I'm not going to reveal our location to any of them because I don't trust that they won't reveal it. I feel that the ruling is fair and will get my brother treatment. I think that we are safe now. I did everything I could. Now I'm in the airport about to fly home and I'm having a drink to close this horrible chapter. Cheers.
Now to the next story. Story 2. My sister tried to seduce my fiancé before our wedding. Got caught on camera and was disowned by our parents. My manipulative, narcissistic sister attempted to seduce my fiancé just before our wedding in an effort to break us apart. Fortunately, her actions were caught on camera, leading to her being disowned by our parents. This story revolves around my older sister, Dove, 29F, who has never been able to tolerate my existence, as she apparently believes I'm living a life that I don't deserve. Dove, who is now divorced and jobless, is living with our parents. She had dropped out of college to be with her wealthy boyfriend, who eventually divorced her when her true nature became apparent. Growing up my relationship with Dove was far from ideal. She was always the pretty and smart one, full of herself, and our parents consistently showered her with praise, which left me feeling inadequate. Everyone around us constantly admired her looks, while I was often ignored, and it hurt deeply. Dove used her popularity to mess with my mind telling me that no one liked me, which made me incredibly insecure. My parents never supported me or acknowledged my feelings because Dove always lived up to their expectations. This led me to distance myself from them throughout my childhood and teenage years. Dove frequently had friends over when our parents were at work, and they would often mess with my room. On one occasion, they even ruined a school project of mine, nearly causing me to fail. When I threatened to tell mom about it, Dove blackmailed me, saying she would share embarrassing pictures of me with my classmates. At just 14 years old, I was terrified. Dove never took responsibility for her actions, and it was pointless to tell my parents because they never paid attention to me. My mom never had my back, although my dad would occasionally call Dove out. For instance, one time she used my phone to send strange pictures to my friends after I'd complained to dad about her. Another time, she spilled coffee on my prom dress and then played the victim, crying and claiming it was an accident. After that, I stopped confiding in him altogether. I never really understood why she harbored so much hatred towards me until later when I realized that she was a narcissist, and her behavior had nothing to do with me. She was a walking red flag in her relationships, cheating on every guy she dated. As much as I hate to admit it, she was also a gold digger. Something her ex, who remains a friend of mine, can fully attest to. Essentially, she was pretty awful as a teenager, and nothing changed as she grew older. If anything, her behavior only got worse. It was entirely my parents' fault because they never bothered to discipline her. After school, things finally started to look up for me. I worked incredibly hard to get into my dream college, and after a few years of struggle, I landed my dream job. It was there that I met the love of my life, Atlas, at an office conference. He was smart, kind, and handsome, and we hit it off instantly. Within a few months, we started dating. We traveled a lot, which only strengthened our bond. Atlas was very close to his family so he introduced me to his siblings and parents just a few months into our relationship. But when it came to introducing him to my own parents, I took my sweet time. The main reason for this delay was my sister Dove and her malicious intentions. I always had this nagging feeling that she would find a way to ruin everything. She was the one who always got the best of everything as a child and teenager and now that my life was going better than hers, I was certain she wouldn't be able to handle it, especially when it came to my relationship. However, I couldn't keep delaying the introduction any longer. Atlas was beginning to grow suspicious of my reluctance to introduce him to my family. So, after a year and a half of dating, I finally told Dad about him. Dad was thrilled that I had found a man who was worthy of me and invited us over for dinner. While I was excited, I was also equally stressed because I knew Dove could go to any lengths to sabotage my happiness. Although Atlas was aware of my family dynamics, I went over it with him in detail. He was relaxed about it and reassured me that he would handle whatever came his way. A few days after I spoke with Dad, I unexpectedly received a call from Dove. It was surprising since she had never reached out to me before. She started asking questions about Atlas and when I planned to visit home, but it was clear that her real interest was in getting more details about Atlas. I can only assume that Mom had told her I was seeing someone and that our relationship was getting serious. Dove was suddenly trying to get all chummy with me, but I could see right through her motives. Now, I'm grappling with whether I should take the risk of introducing Atlas to Dove, knowing full well that her intentions are far from good. I'm also considering an alternative, perhaps inviting my parents over to my place so they can meet Atlas without involving Dove. Update 1, thanks for all the great advice. Some of you asked for more details about Dove, so here you go. It's true that my parents, especially my dad, began to see Dove differently after her divorce, and she really brought it on herself. She had been academically gifted, but once she got to college, her entire focus shifted to her looks and beauty. That's when she met Jeremy, a super rich guy, and jumped into a relationship with him, completely abandoning her studies. During my final year of school, 
I was busy preparing for my college entrance exams, and Dove kept telling me I would never get into my dream college. But I did, and for the first time, I got validation from my parents. They were genuinely happy and proud of me, but Dove couldn't stand it. She was jealous that all the attention was on me and not on her. To sabotage my moment, she announced her engagement to Jeremy at the celebration party my parents had organized for me with close family and friends. It was obvious from Jeremy's expression that he had no idea she was going to do this, but she succeeded in making the day all about herself. Everyone immediately became curious about Jeremy because, according to Dove, he was extremely wealthy. Dove loved to show off the expensive gifts he bought her and would constantly tell me that I'd never find a rich husband because I was ugly and no one would want to date someone like me, always trying to make me feel bad. I eventually told her that I wasn't a gold digger like her and that I could pay my own bills, so she could have the rich husband if that's what she wanted. In truth, she was incredibly selfish and downright evil, the most selfish person I've ever known. A week later, Dove and Jeremy got engaged, but by then I was already off to college and didn't attend the engagement. During my time in college, I had no communication with her. It actually felt good to come home for the holidays, knowing that Dove was living with Jeremy. Even during the holidays, she would often be away on vacations to exotic locations with him. After a year of dating, they had a lavish wedding, with most of the expenses covered by Jeremy. Dad chipped in for the remaining costs as a courtesy since Dove wasn't earning anything. Their marriage didn't last long, though. After three years, they got divorced. The reason, as I later found out, was that Dove didn't want to have children, while Jeremy was eager to become a father. Although he assured me he never pressured her, he was frustrated that she never disclosed her feelings about it beforehand, and had avoided the conversation for three years. He also mentioned her drinking and partying habits, flirting with guys at bars, and that she had married him purely for his money, with no emotional connection. I couldn't help but wonder how he remained blind to her true motives for so long. Jeremy even showed me videos of Dove out drinking with guys who were touching her inappropriately, and she did nothing to stop them. I was relieved he finally ended things with her, but my parents took Dove's side, blaming Jeremy for pressuring her about having kids, never acknowledging her faults. After the divorce, Dove moved back in with my parents since she wasn't working. She had dropped out of college to marry Jeremy, and now, after five years, she had no degree and no work experience. She pretended to be traumatized by the divorce, but in reality, she was happy to be free. Within a month of the divorce, she was back to her old habits, clubbing and hooking up. Her life seemed to revolve around weekly dates and ditching people, and her Instagram stories made it clear what she was really up to. Two years into my career, I landed my dream job with a great salary, and my parents were thrilled. After receiving the job offer, I visited home, and dad was so proud of me, I couldn't have been happier. We were having dinner when Dove returned home, looking partially drunk. Dad was upset at the sight of her and commented that Dove should have focused on her education like I did, instead of ruining her life over Jeremy. He pointed out how much I was earning and how Dove was still dependent on them for money. Mom tried to get Dad to stop making such comments, but hearing this, Dove lost her temper and slammed the door. That's when Dad finally realized just how spoiled Dove had become. He told Mom that it was time to knock some sense into her, insisting that Dove needed to start taking her life seriously and get back on her feet instead of continuing to leech off them. By this point, I was completely fed up with her. Later, Dove barged into my room and smugly told me that no matter how much money I made, I could never be like her. She even went as far as to body shame me, pointing out my belly fat and chubby cheeks. As a teenager, those kinds of comments used to break my heart, but now, I just didn't care. I laughed in her face and told her that I had no desire to be like her and that she clearly needed to work on fixing her attitude. That set her off, and she demanded that I leave the house. I calmly reminded her that this was our parents' house, and she had no authority to boss me around. The next day, as I was packing to leave, I noticed that two of my dresses had been badly torn, clearly cut with scissors. I went downstairs and showed my parents what Dove had done. Dad was furious and called Dove out, but Mom, as usual, tried to make excuses for her, claiming Dove was in shock and didn't know what she was doing. Dad wasn't having any of it. He warned Mom to stay out of it and then unleashed his anger on Dove telling her that she needed to get her life together because he was done providing for her or tolerating her narcissism. This confrontation didn't sit well with Dove, and she ended up hating me even more because of it. From that point on, I was subjected to Dove's wrath, but her hatred didn't bother me. It only became unbearable when she started making advances on my boyfriend. After much consideration and talking it over with Atlas, I decided it was time to visit my parents with him. There was no point in hiding him from Dove any longer because, no matter how hard I tried, she would eventually find a way to get to him. 
My friends advised me that it was better to test his loyalty now than to risk losing him later. Dove would only succeed in her malicious intentions if Atlas allowed it. With a sense of dread I showed up at my parents' house with Atlas. I tell you, she was practically throwing herself at him. As he was exchanging greetings with mom and dad, Dove almost forcefully pushed herself onto him for a hug. I have no idea what made her think Atlas would fall for her looks. She had completely transformed her appearance, dyeing her blonde hair black, getting all dressed up in a new outfit, with her nails and hair perfectly done, as if she was on a date with him. She tried to force her way into the conversation, but it was clear that everyone was ignoring her. At the dinner table, she quickly rushed to sit beside Atlas. When I asked her to move so I could sit there, she gave me an annoyed look but eventually complied. She kept asking Atlas about his interests, and if he mentioned liking something, she would immediately claim she liked it too, even if it was obvious she didn't. Then she'd go on about how she and Atlas were so compatible, winking at me as if to suggest I shouldn't take it seriously, though it was clear she was trying to cover up her intentions. Atlas was visibly uncomfortable, and he ignored her, continuing his conversation with dad and mom. Her desperate attempt was so blatantly obvious. After dinner, I decided to take a shower, leaving Atlas by himself. That's when Dove walked in, asking him to call her number because she claimed she couldn't find her phone. It was obvious that this was just a ploy to get his number. How twisted. Atlas also told me that while I was occupied with other things, Dove tried to play the victim, telling him her sob story about the divorce and how much mental distress it had caused her, dragging on about how it took her years to recover. To make matters worse, mom even chimed in, blaming Jeremy and speaking ill of him. After a while, Atlas asked me if I wanted to go for a walk and give him a tour of the neighborhood. Before I could respond my sister quickly stood up and said, sure. Atlas looked at her, surprised, and firmly stated that he wanted some alone time with me. Her face turned red with embarrassment and she quietly retreated to her room. It's only been a few days since that visit and I can already sense that Dove is planning more schemes to lure Atlas into her trap. I can't deny that it worries me, but at the same time, I trust my man and am curious to see how he handles her advances. Update 2. Hello everyone, I'm thrilled to share that I'm engaged. Atlas proposed to me last month during a trip and yes, he got down on one knee with a ring, and I couldn't stop gushing over it. But even after our visit to my parents, Dove didn't stop with her manipulative tactics. She started texting Atlas, asking how he was doing. Knowing that Atlas is a huge cat lover, Dove began flooding his inbox with cute cat videos, even though she never cared for cats before. After discovering that Atlas adored cats, she went so far as to get one herself and began recording videos of it to send to him. For the first few weeks, Atlas showed me Dove's desperate attempts to appear caring and concerned. Sending messages that pretended to inquire about his work and well-being. After a while though, he stopped sharing her messages with me. I assumed she had finally given up on him and moved on, and we both shifted our focus back to more important things, especially with our busy work schedules. One day, as I was scrolling through social media, I noticed that Dove had added Atlas to her account. She was liking and commenting on nearly all of his posts, using silly heart icons. She even went back and commented on old pictures and videos from 7 to 10 years ago. I immediately felt uneasy about it, so out of the blue I checked his phone. I discovered that Dove was still texting him occasionally, but her messages were unread and seemed odd. She was clearly trying hard to get Atlas's attention. In his call logs, I saw missed calls from her, including one that came in around 3 a.m., which made me feel anxious. I confronted Atlas about why he hadn't told me that Dove was still texting him. He got a bit nervous and explained that he had been ignoring her and thought it was better if we didn't talk about her. I pressed him further about the calls, and he remained calm. Then he sat me down and explained that one day, Dove had called him, sounding really upset. He got scared, thinking something might be seriously wrong, but it turned out she just started talking about traumatic experiences related to Jeremy, saying she needed someone to talk to. Atlas told Dove that she should talk to her parents instead and that it wasn't appropriate to call so late. He also mentioned that she should have let me know first. That really struck a nerve with me, and I told him that keeping this from me wasn't okay and could lead to me losing trust in him. He reassured me that he would never fall for her tricks and that I had nothing to worry about. Even with his reassurance, I had read too many stories about husbands falling into similar traps, and I didn't want to be naive by blindly trusting him. I told him that the next time Dove called, he should hand the phone over to me so I could catch her in the act. Sure enough, one night, her call came through, and Atlas woke me up in the middle of the night. I answered the phone, and Dove immediately went silent when she heard my voice. She quickly claimed it was a mistake and hung up. The next day, I tried calling her multiple times to confront her, but she never picked up. 
So I texted her from Atlas's phone, letting her know it was me and that she needed to stop calling or texting him at odd hours. I also told her that if there was anything urgent she should contact me directly instead. After that, she finally stopped texting him, and I felt relieved that she was out of our lives. After Atlas proposed to me I sent a picture of the ring to my dad. Dove must have shown it to mom, and not long after, she started her stalking behavior again. She began texting Atlas and sending ridiculous videos. I was completely fed up. As soon as Atlas told me, I called her and unleashed all my pent-up anger, telling her to stop playing games and get a life. She mostly stayed silent while I let it all out, but I didn't realize at the time that she wasn't going to back down easily. As soon as I hung up, mom called, furious, yelling at me for insulting my sister. Dove had told her that I was accusing her of trying to steal my fiancé. Mom claimed that my cruelty had caused Dove to have panic attacks and insisted that I be more considerate toward her, reminding me that Dove had been struggling with depression for years and was still recovering from her traumatic divorce. I found it laughable because Dove was never depressed about her divorce. I hung up the call and immediately informed Dad that if they continued to ignore Dove's behavior, I would have no choice but to cut them out of my life. I was done being a puppet in her game. I couldn't keep turning a blind eye to her antics. Update 3 I never imagined Dove would stoop so low. She had always made my life miserable, but I never thought she would actually try to seduce my fiancé before our wedding. The bullying, body shaming and constant ridicule were one thing, but realizing that she was willing to go as far as trying to ruin my wedding by seducing Atlas was a bitter pill to swallow. As we were planning our wedding, I wasn't in contact with mom after our last confrontation. However, she eventually called and apologized for shouting at me, admitting that she had lost control out of fear for Dove, who was supposedly having panic attacks. One of my cousins later told me that Dove had been crying to everyone about how I was accusing her of trying to steal my fiancé and that I didn't deserve any of the good things in my life, especially Atlas. According to Dove, because she was the gorgeous one, she believed she should be the one getting the best of everything, not me. When I told mom about this, she went quiet. She simply told me to forget everything and focus on my wedding and the happy life ahead. Fortunately, everything went as planned, and Dove managed to keep a low profile for a while. At the very least, she didn't interfere in our lives during that time. On the day of our wedding, we were at the venue, busy with final preparations, when I received a call from Atlas's best friend, asking me to come to Atlas's room with my parents. I jokingly teased him, saying that Atlas wasn't supposed to see the bride before the ceremony, but he insisted that this was something serious that needed to be dealt with before the wedding. My heart raced as I hurried to Atlas's room with my parents. When we arrived, Atlas was lying shirtless, drifting in and out of consciousness, while his groomsmen recounted Dove's devious actions. Apparently, while Atlas was getting ready, Dove had shown up with a drink. He initially refused it, but Dove persisted until he took a sip. Almost immediately, Atlas realized the drink was spiked. He excused himself and went to the washroom, where he called his friend, explained what had happened and asked him to come over. By the time his friend arrived, Atlas had partially passed out and was out of the washroom. Since his friend was sharing the room with Atlas, he had access and quickly turned on his camera as he entered. He overheard Atlas shouting at Dove to leave him alone while she was on top of him. Undressing herself, and rubbing against him. This disgusting act was captured on camera. When Dove noticed Atlas's friend, she pretended they were making out, covered herself up and left the room, smirking at his friend and asking him not to tell anyone. Little did she know that she had already been caught on video. When we walked in, Atlas was still lying there partially unconscious. The drink was so potent that even a few sips had left him severely dizzy with a pounding headache. The glass was still there, with solid particles settled at the bottom. It was an incredibly humiliating moment for my parents, who were in disbelief that Dove could do something so horrendous. My mom immediately called Dove and told her to come to Atlas's room. When she arrived, her lipstick was smudged, and she nonchalantly said, I know you guys are mad at me, but it was mutual. Atlas loves me and has been making advances on me ever since we met. Today, he convinced me to have a one-time hookup before the wedding. My mom slapped her hard, telling her that we were aware of her lies and that everything had been recorded on camera. Dove was stunned by this revelation, and my parents wasted no time in kicking her out of the venue before she could cause any more trouble. Security was instructed not to allow her back inside. It was obvious that she had been trying to make it known that she had been with Atlas, hoping I would call off the wedding. My dad immediately called a doctor, who confirmed that Atlas had indeed been served a spike drink, which had severely affected him. Atlas's parents and siblings were so upset that they wanted to confront Dove, but my parents had to apologize profusely to them to help calm the situation. The wedding had to be delayed until Atlas recovered, 
which took several rounds of vomiting to get through. Word of the incident spread quickly among the guests, who were buzzing with gossip for the next few days. Once Atlas had fully recovered, my dad walked me down the aisle. While I was happy to finally see Atlas as my husband, I couldn't shake the stress of everything that had transpired. During our vows, Atlas added an extra promise, vowing to protect our relationship from anyone who didn't want to see us together. After we returned from our honeymoon, my parents came to visit us and apologized to Atlas for all the trouble Dove had caused. My dad reassured us that Dove would be out of our lives for good. He had actually kicked her out of the house and told her to fend for herself. Despite this, I'm still struggling to move past the incident. My wedding was perilously close to being called off, and if Atlas's friend hadn't recorded what happened, I might never have believed that Atlas was innocent in all of this. Now to the next story, story 3. Mother-in-law ruined my wedding. By spiking my drink, then tried to buy my forgiveness with $5k, now we're left to navigate the fallout. My mother-in-law secretly spiked my drink at my wedding, causing me to faint and ruin the reception. Now she's trying to buy my forgiveness with $5,000 because my husband has made his decision. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel, 27F, and I just got married a week ago to my wonderful husband Jaden, 32M. The wedding felt like something straight out of a telenovela. This whole journey began two years ago at a local coffee shop. I was a regular there, always needing my morning caffeine fix to start the day. One day, I noticed a tall guy with kind eyes standing in line behind me. He seemed nice, but to be honest, I wasn't really paying much attention. All I could think about was getting my hands on a latte. Later that same week, I bumped into him again, and this time, we ended up chatting while waiting for our coffees. We talked about everything. Our favorite books, weird childhood stories, and even our mutual love for that cozy little coffee shop. We laughed a lot, and for the first time that day I felt truly awake. Looking back, I realized that I was quick to judge at first, perhaps because I was so absorbed in my routine or because Jaden wasn't the kind of guy I typically gravitated toward. But that day, something shifted in me. There was a genuine kindness in him, a warmth in his smile that I couldn't ignore. We exchanged numbers and that very night, Jaden texted me, asking if I wanted to grab dinner sometime. We ended up going to this tiny Italian place hidden away on a side street. The food was incredible, but the best part was our conversation. We talked for hours, and it felt effortless. We discovered we had a surprising amount in common, a love for old movies, a secret passion for karaoke, even though neither of us is very good, and a shared obsession with tacos. Over the next few weeks, we started seeing more and more of each other. We went on hikes, explored museums, and even tried, and failed, to take a pottery class together. The more time I spent with Jaden, the more I realized how special he was. He was funny, intelligent, supportive and always knew how to make me smile. He pushed me to be a better person and made me feel like I could be completely myself around him. Then, on our second anniversary, Jaden surprised me with the most incredible proposal. We were on a weekend getaway to a charming cabin in the mountains. It was snowing softly outside, and we were cuddled up by the fireplace when Jaden got down on one knee and pulled out a ring. I don't even remember exactly what he said because all I could focus on was the love shining in his eyes. Of course, I said yes. As soon as we got back from our cabin trip, I dove into planning the wedding with so much excitement. But this is where things took an unexpected turn. After Jaden and I got engaged, I met his mom, Maria, 57, for the first time. She lived a bit out of town, so we hadn't had the chance to meet before. At first, Maria was incredibly sweet to me. She talked about how thrilled she was to finally have a daughter-in-law. Jaden was her only child, and she mentioned that she had always wanted more children, so having me join the family felt like a big deal to her, almost like gaining another child. She even hugged me warmly and said she couldn't wait to get to know me better. However, things began to change rather quickly. That weekend, Maria came to stay with us to help with some wedding planning and to spend more time together. Initially, I was thrilled, thinking we'd bond and grow closer. But as the weekend progressed, her attitude shifted in a way that made me uncomfortable. The first passive-aggressive remark came during breakfast on Saturday morning. I had made a batch of my favorite pancakes, and while Jaden was outside enjoying his coffee, Maria looked at me with a smile and said, Oh I guess you don't worry too much about carbs huh? I laughed it off at the moment, assuming it was just a casual comment, but it stung a bit. Later that day, as we were flipping through some wedding dress magazines, Maria pointed at a model and remarked, This dress is stunning, but it's meant for someone with a very specific figure. Not everyone can pull it off. She glanced at me as she said it and it felt like a subtle dig, suggesting she didn't think I could wear something like that. I just nodded and tried to brush it off, but the comment lingered, 
making me feel self-conscious. The remarks kept coming. When we were out shopping for some decorations, she casually mentioned, you know, my friend's daughter lost 20 pounds for her wedding. She looked so stunning. Have you thought about doing something like that? I was taken aback and didn't really know how to respond. I mumbled something about being content with my body as it is, but it left me feeling judged, as if she thought I should be trying to lose weight for the wedding. The next morning, while she was looking through my kitchen cupboards, she commented, Oh, you have a lot of snacks here. I'd try to keep my house a bit more on the healthy side. You don't want to gain weight before the wedding, do you? I couldn't believe she was still harping on about my weight, and it was beginning to really hurt my feelings. It felt like she was picking on me. Even though she always had a smile on her face and spoke in a seemingly kind tone. What struck me as odd was that Maria never made those comments in front of Jaden. It was as if she had a switch she could flip on and off. When Jaden was around, she was all smiles and sweet words, but the moment he stepped out or was in another room, she'd start making those passive-aggressive remarks. I felt like I was living in two different worlds, one where I was accepted and loved, and another where I was constantly judged and criticized. Initially, I didn't think it was necessary to bring this issue up with Jaden. After all, it was his mom, and I didn't want to create any tension between us, especially since we had just gotten engaged and were in such a blissful place. I kept telling myself that it was just a minor inconvenience, something I could handle. Besides, I'm not exactly thin. I have curves, and I'm proud of my body. I've worked hard to feel confident in my own skin. Maria's remarks were more annoying than anything else. It felt like she was trying to undermine my confidence, but I was determined not to let her get to me. However, Maria started coming over more frequently. It felt like she was around every weekend and it was beginning to drive me a little crazy. I worked from Monday to Friday and only had the weekends to focus on wedding planning. But every time I turned around, there was Maria, offering to help or just hanging around. It was tough to concentrate on wedding preparations with her constantly there, making little comments and acting like she knew better than I did. One weekend, she called to say she'd be coming over again. I felt a knot of anxiety in my stomach because I really needed some time alone to plan without her input. So I told her I was going to be busy and wouldn't be at home. She asked what I was up to, and before I could stop myself, I blurted out that I was going to look at wedding dresses. I think I just wanted her to know that I had important things to do. To my surprise, she got really excited and said she'd love to come along. I didn't know how to say no without sounding rude, so I reluctantly agreed. The next thing I knew, she was at my door, beaming and eager to help me find the perfect dress. I tried to smile back, but inside, I was dreading how this shopping trip would unfold. We visited a few bridal shops, and from the moment we stepped inside, Maria was in full mom mode, suggesting dresses that didn't appeal to me and making comments about how certain styles wouldn't flatter my figure. It was utterly draining, I felt like I couldn't even breathe without her casting judgment. When I tried on a dress that I genuinely loved, she remarked, it's nice, but don't you think it's a bit snug around the waist? Maybe something more flowy would suit you better. I was crushed because I adored that dress, but her words made me second-guess myself. By the end of the day, I hadn't found a dress, and I was feeling pretty low. Thankfully, Maria went back to her place, and I finally had a moment of peace. For the next few days, she kept texting me, asking when I would be looking for dresses again. I just kept saying that I didn't know when I'd have the time. I was determined not to tell her when I planned to go shopping. But my plan unraveled when Jaden mentioned to his mom that I'd be going dress shopping the next day. So she called me, asking what time she should come over. I found myself at a crossroads. Maria had already made so many remarks about my body that I dreaded the idea of her tagging along. I knew that if I took her with me to the bridal shop, she would ruin the day with more comments and judgments, so I decided to come up with an excuse. I told her that the bridal shop had a rule allowing only two people to accompany me, and my mom and maid of honor were already on their way. I realize now that it was a pretty lame excuse, but at that moment I couldn't think of anything else. Maria quickly pointed out how ridiculous my explanation was and said, what kind of bridal shop only allows two people? That's just silly. I fumbled for a response and said, I know it's weird, but that's what they told me. I was sweating bullets because I knew how flimsy my lie sounded. I hurriedly told her I had to go and ended the call before she could ask any more questions. As soon as I hung up, a huge wave of guilt washed over me. I hated lying, especially to Jaden's mom, but I just couldn't face another day of her making me feel bad about myself. I decided to focus on the positive and remind myself that this day was supposed to be fun and exciting. My mom and maid of honor picked me up and we headed to the bridal shop. I did my best to shake off the lingering guilt and just enjoy the moment, and in the end, I found a dress that I absolutely loved. After that, 
Maria didn't call, text, or even visit our house. She still kept in touch with Jaden, which was a bit of a relief since it avoided any awkwardness between them. I sent her a picture of me in the wedding dress, hoping to share some of my excitement with her. She responded with just a thumbs up emoji and nothing else. I wasn't sure how to interpret that, but I decided not to overthink it. With so much to do as the wedding approached, I didn't have time to dwell on her reaction. As the wedding day drew nearer, I became increasingly busy with all the preparations. Honestly, I didn't reach out to Maria again. There was so much to coordinate, finalizing the guest list, confirming the caterers, and ensuring that all the decorations were perfect. Finally, the big day arrived. It exceeded all my expectations. The ceremony was beautiful, and I couldn't stop smiling as I walked down the aisle toward Jaden. The look on his face when he saw me in my dress was priceless, making all the stress of planning worthwhile. We said our vows, exchanged rings and just like that, we were married. The reception started off perfectly. The venue was gorgeous, the weather was ideal, the food was delicious and everyone seemed to be having a great time. I loved our first dance, Jaden and I had taken a few dance lessons and we managed not to step on each other's toes. It felt like a fairy tale, and I was on cloud nine. Everything was going smoothly until I decided to get a drink. I walked over to the bar for something refreshing, and there was Maria, standing right there. She turned to me with a big smile and said, You look like you're having a wonderful time, let me get you a drink, just relax and enjoy yourself. I was a bit taken aback by her sudden enthusiasm but thought maybe she was trying to make up for all the awkwardness. She handed me a Shirley Temple, and I thanked her and took a sip. A few minutes later, I started feeling drowsy, but I assumed it was just because I was tired. Then, I fainted on the floor and lost consciousness. Everything went black, and the next thing I knew, Jaden was panicking and calling for an ambulance. I could hear the worry in his voice as he tried to keep me awake. People were gathering around, but it was all a blur. When the EMTs arrived, they quickly brought me back to consciousness and began asking questions about what I had eaten and drunk that day. I told them everything including the meal I had at the reception and the Shirley Temple that Maria had given me. They expressed concern and asked if there was anything unusual or if I had taken any medication. That's when Maria, looking a bit guilty, stepped forward and admitted that the drink she gave me had alcohol in it. She explained that she didn't think it would be a big deal and thought it would help me relax. I was stunned, why would she add alcohol to my drink without telling me? The situation became even more complicated when my maid of honor, Emily, spoke up. She informed the EMTs that I had taken some anxiety medication just minutes before walking down the aisle. I had been so anxious about everything going off without a hitch that I took a small dose to calm my nerves. It turned out that the combination of the medication and the alcohol in the drink was what caused me to collapse. There must have been some kind of chemical reaction that knocked me out. The EMTs explained that mixing alcohol with certain medications can be very dangerous and that I was fortunate the outcome wasn't more severe. After the EMTs left, Jaden turned to Maria and demanded that she leave. His voice was shaking with anger, and Maria looked completely shocked. She tried to explain, insisting she hadn't meant any harm and that it was all just a misunderstanding, but Jaden wasn't having any of it. He shouted at her to leave the reception immediately. I had never seen him so furious, and it broke my heart to witness his anger towards his mom on what was supposed to be a joyful day. With all the chaos, I wasn't feeling well, and the mood at the reception took a nosedive. Guests started to feel uncomfortable and the joyous atmosphere we had worked so hard to create just vanished. People began leaving one by one, and before we knew it the reception ended early. It was devastating to see everyone leave so soon, and I felt like the day I had been dreaming of for so long had been ruined. Jaden and I went back to our hotel room, and I was left trying to process everything that had happened. I felt numb, exhausted, and overwhelmed with sadness. This day was supposed to be one of the happiest of my life, but instead, it had turned into a nightmare because of a careless prank. I couldn't believe that Maria's actions had destroyed our special day. Maria kept texting and calling both me and Jaden, but neither of us responded. We needed some time to process everything and figure out our next steps. I could see that Jaden was deeply troubled by the situation. He loved his mom, but he was also incredibly hurt and angry over what she had done. It was a difficult situation, and I had no idea how to fix it. When we finally returned home, I tried to put the whole incident behind me and focus on starting our new life together but it wasn't easy. Every time I thought about our wedding day, I felt a pang of sorrow. I kept replaying the events in my mind, wondering how things could have turned out differently if Maria hadn't pulled that prank. It felt like a dark cloud hanging over what should have been a beautiful memory. Thankfully, we soon left for our honeymoon, and it was such a relief to escape all the drama and stress. 
Jaden and I had an amazing time exploring new places and creating beautiful memories together. It was the perfect getaway. And for those two weeks, I felt like everything was back to normal. We laughed, relaxed, and enjoyed each other's company without a care in the world. When we returned home, reality hit us hard. The moment we pulled into the driveway, there was Maria, standing at the door. My heart sank, and a wave of anxiety washed over me. I had anticipated this confrontation, but I wasn't prepared for it to happen as soon as we got back. What made it worse was that she didn't offer an apology. Instead, she kept insisting that it wasn't her fault and that it was all just a prank. She tried to justify her actions, saying things like, I didn't think it would hurt you. And I just wanted to lighten the mood. It was infuriating to watch her refuse to take responsibility for what she had done. I couldn't believe she was trying to downplay the whole incident as if it were just a harmless joke. Jaden couldn't hold back any longer, he snapped and told her that enough was enough. He said she had crossed a line and needed to own up to her actions. He made it clear that the only way he would talk to her again was if she apologized to me. He told her that she had hurt me deeply, and it was not acceptable. Maria tried to interrupt, but Jaden didn't let her. He went on to say that from now on, they would only be seeing each other during holidays. No more random weekend visits, no unnecessary calls. He told her it would be like they were distant relatives who only met on special occasions. Maria was shocked and started to cry, but Jaden remained firm. I could see how painful it was for him to have to set such boundaries with his own mother, but he was determined to support me and ensure I felt safe and respected. Yesterday, while I was at work, I got a call from Maria. It caught me off guard because we hadn't spoken in a while, and I wasn't expecting her to reach out, especially during work hours. She told me she was outside my office and wanted to meet. I was surprised and didn't want her coming inside and causing any unnecessary drama, so I agreed to meet her outside to avoid a scene. We sat down at a small cafe across the street and I could tell she was really upset. As soon as we began talking, she broke down in tears. It was awkward because people around us started to stare. She told me she couldn't believe what Jaden was doing. He wasn't answering her calls or responding to her messages. She was distraught and begged me to talk to him on her behalf, saying she just wanted things to go back to the way they were before. I want to point out that, up until this moment, Maria still hadn't apologized to me for what happened at the wedding. It was as if she was in complete denial about the impact of her actions. I told her that instead of coming to my office and causing a scene, she should be thinking about how her actions had affected both me and Jaden. I explained that she had ruined my wedding day, and it wasn't fair to expect me to just brush that aside and talk to Jaden for her. She tried to defend herself, saying she didn't mean any harm and was sorry I reacted the way I did. It was as though she couldn't see past her own perspective and understand that her actions had real consequences. She kept insisting that if she had known what would happen, she never would have done it. As she continued to cry, I noticed people in the cafe beginning to glance over with concern. The whole situation made me incredibly uncomfortable, and I just wanted to leave. I told her that I would see what I could do, but I didn't make any promises. Up until now I still haven't talked to Jaden about it because I'm not sure if I'm ready to forgive Maria. After all, she only apologized after I prompted her to do so. My mom thinks I should just let it go and forgive my mother-in-law but I'm not entirely sure. What do you all think? I'd really appreciate your advice. Update 1. Hi everyone, thank you so much for your comments and suggestions. It really means a lot to have a space where I can share my story and receive support. Maria's constant texts and calls were starting to wear me down. So I decided it was time to have another conversation with Jaden and figure out how we could move forward. I told Jaden that Maria had come to my office and apologized to me. It wasn't entirely true. Her apology wasn't exactly what I needed, but I felt like it was time to start mending things, even if just a little. I told him that I had forgiven her, which was mostly true, because I wanted to move past this mess and focus on our future. Jaden looked at me with concern and asked if I was really sure. I assured him that I was ready to move on, but we needed to set some boundaries with his mom to avoid any more drama. He seemed relieved that I was willing to forgive her, but he also recognized that this wasn't just about me. It was about us as a couple and our need for peace and stability. After our talk, Jaden texted Maria, letting her know that he was glad she had apologized to me and that we were ready to try and move forward. However, he also made it clear that the boundaries we set before still stood, no more dropping by unannounced, no more constant calls, and no more overstepping her limits. He told her that we needed some space to focus on our own lives. Maria responded almost right away, saying that she was sorry for everything and that she just wanted to be a part of our lives. She promised to respect our boundaries and give us the space we needed. I still have mixed feelings about the whole situation. On one hand, 
I'm glad that Maria seems to be taking our boundaries seriously. But on the other, I still feel a bit uneasy because I know that one slip-up could bring all the drama back. I'm trying to focus on the positive and remind myself that we are making progress, even if it's slow. Some of you have asked about my anxiety, and I want to thank you for your concern. I don't feel comfortable going into too much detail, but I do want to clarify that my anxiety wasn't about Jaden or our relationship. I knew he was the one for me from the moment things got serious between us. The anxiety was more related to the wedding day itself and the immense pressure that comes with planning such a big event. We had over 200 guests attending, and I was determined for everything to be perfect. I worried endlessly about all the little things that could go wrong, like the food not turning out well, the music not being enjoyable, or the decorations not living up to my expectations. The thought of any detail going awry made me incredibly anxious. I wanted our guests to have an amazing time and to remember our wedding as a beautiful and joyous celebration. Update 2. Hi everyone, something unexpected happened, and I'm still trying to figure out how to feel about it. Things were going smoothly until last weekend when Jaden received a call from Maria inviting both of us to dinner at her place. She mentioned that it was important for us to have this dinner to start getting things back to normal after everything that had happened. Jaden told me about the invitation and asked what I thought. I told him it would be okay and that we should go. Maybe this was her way of trying to make amends. When we got to Maria's house, she greeted us with a warm smile. But after dinner, Maria did something that completely took me by surprise. She got up, left the room, and came back with a check for $5,000. She handed it to me, saying she was truly sorry for ruining our wedding day and that, while she couldn't change the past, she wanted to give me this money as a way to make up for it. I was completely taken aback and immediately felt uncomfortable. It was such an unexpected gesture and I didn't know how to respond. I refused the money right away, telling her that I didn't need it and that we should just let bygones be bygones. Jaden agreed and told her that she didn't have to give us any money, but Maria was persistent. She wouldn't take the check back and ended up slipping it into my coat pocket. I was so shocked and didn't know how to handle it, she seemed almost desperate for us to accept it, which only made the situation more awkward. After that, we left her house and headed back home. On the way, Jaden and I talked about what had happened and we were both confused. Why would Maria give us such a large amount of money? It felt strange, and I couldn't help but wonder what her true intentions were. Was she genuinely sorry, or was this her way of trying to buy our forgiveness? I'm not sure and it's left me feeling really unsettled. Jaden and I discussed it again, and we're still not certain about what to do. He's just as confused as I am, and we both want to approach this situation in a way that's fair and respectful. We don't want to hurt Maria's feelings or dismiss her attempts to make amends, but at the same time, we don't want to feel like we're being bought off. If anyone has any advice or has gone through something similar, I'd really appreciate hearing your thoughts. Update 3. It's been two weeks since my last update and honestly, not much has changed. We still have the check that Maria gave us, but we haven't cashed it. It's just sitting in our drawer, almost like a reminder of everything that's happened. I'm not really sure what we'll end up doing with it, but for now, it's just there. As for our relationship with Maria, things are pretty much the same, we're all in this holding pattern where we're trying to be civil and respectful without revisiting the past too much. She's been respecting our boundaries, which has been a huge relief. She doesn't show up unannounced anymore, and the constant barrage of texts and calls has stopped. It feels like she's genuinely trying to do better, and that gives me some hope for the future. Jaden and Maria still talk on the phone regularly, and their conversations seem to be positive. I'm relieved that their relationship hasn't suffered too much from everything that happened. I also talk to Maria sometimes. Our conversations are polite and a bit formal, but both of us are making an effort to keep things friendly. I think this will be my last update for a while. I don't expect much to change anytime soon, and I'm hopeful that things will continue to improve little by little. I want to focus on the positive and keep moving forward, and I believe that's the best approach for now. If anything major happens, I might pop back in with an update, but for now, I'm going to take a step back and concentrate on living my life. Thank you again for all your support, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real-life stories happening around you.